Welcome to the We're Libertarians Daily Podcast. I am your host, Hody Jones, and I am joined by friend and champion, Alicia Dern. Alicia, how are you doing today? I'm great. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's nice to talk to you. Yeah, you as well. You as well. It's, uh, it is awesome to have you on. Uh, I wish it were under the best circumstances ever. Uh, mm -hmm. Not that you don't love to talk about abortion just all the time. All but the time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know here here's the deal Alicia I had a lot of people chime in this week we had a little discussion about abortion on my uh, on my social media accounts and it was good it was really positive the people who weren't positive nobody responded to them and that's the way it should work you know <laughs> it's just as opposed to a big argument they just got ignored and that's perfect so uh, but you were one of them and and I wanted to get some of the I wanted to get the heavy hitters on both the pro-choice and the pro-life life perspective. So you're kind of taking the pro-choice angle to it yes. and it helps that you're also a, a legal expert. So let's just have I guess let's just start with your thoughts. Um, why don't we start with abortion in general before we get to the nitty gritty about the the legal uh especially the new laws alabama is obviously famous but there's like five of them that passed heartbeat laws so let's just right. let's start with just abortion in general and your thoughts on it oh okay well good yeah so i have strong feelings about abortion but it really comes from um my personal experience as a woman um and as a woman who has struggled with uh fertility issues my whole life so um fr from my standpoint i Pregnancy is not something that is easy for me to achieve. In fact, I have not been able to get pregnant. Um, if I do get pregnant, and I've been making attempts at that for years, um, I uh, have um, issues such that pregnancy might have to be terminated because it could be fatal to me. And so um, it's like it, it's one of those things where, you know, it's like a 10% chance that I could suffer from uh, something called uterine, uterine rupture, which is uh, I get pregnant and then my uterus can't uh, sustain the pregnancy and it ruptures. And when an organ ruptures, any organ, that can be deadly and uterine rupture is no different. And so when people say to me, well, if you get pregnant, you have to carry it to term uh, or else you're committing murder. Uh, I have a problem with that because the question to me is you're either telling me that I have to be sterilized and not take any risk of being pregnant, or I'm going to have a 10% risk of death if I manage to get pregnant. And both of those are, you know, uh, those are very harsh outcomes and very personal outcomes to me uh, as a woman who, for, for a couple of reasons, I don't want to get sterilized. There's health that, um, repercussions to having hysterectomies and things like that. There is also, so, you know, as long as I don't do that, there's a possibility of getting pregnant. There's a health repercussion of getting pregnant. Now I understand that not all women have this type of issue, but it's a lot more women than you think. So it's uh, one in seven women have fertility issues. Um, although women don't die frequently from childbirth anymore, that's a relatively recent thing in modern medicine. Um, and if we start taking away options from women, I, we could see those things rise. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's more women than you think suffer from medical issues. And a lot of times you don't know those medical issues exist until after you get pregnant, you know? And so I don't want us to be a society where we tell women that 10% um, of them or 15% of them have to be sterilized because they're they have disabilities or they have chronic illnesses like I do. So th that's part of the problem that I have with abortion. The other problem that I have is that, you know, I have um, a, a, quite a few doctors and one of my doctors who's an expert in um, difficult pregnancies said to me one day, pregnancy is not a benign state in a woman. He said, in fact, it's not a healthy state in a woman. I mean, women's bodies endure it. They adapt to it. There's all kinds of things that go on in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But it's not as healthy as being not pregnant. And so it's we I don't want to in the in the discussion about the rights of the fetus lose track of the rights of the mother. And so, you know, a lot of people they sort of draw like this black and white conclusion, you know, the fetus is a life, ergo, the mother's life is forfeit or something, and I'm not really sure, or they don't think about the mother's life. And and when you start talking about things like positive rights versus negative rights or property rights, I think you lose track of what we're really discussing here, which is you have the life of the mother, which is truly impacted. It's really impacted both physically 
and um, her time and finances and all of that. And then you also have the would-be life of the fetus. And we don't really have a good answer to the question of when does life, sentient life start such that rights attach to it. And really that's the argument. I know people want to say it's all these other things, but really the argument is when does it become immoral to kill a life? You know, uh, all, uh, all carbon life forms, you know, we've got life in our, our cells and every time you scratch your skin, you kill, kill a skin cell. So we obviously don't attach life rights to every, um, you know, carbon life form that, that uh, scientifically can be ascribed I don't life. feel bad for the mosquitoes yeah. I hit when I'm driving to work. Right, exactly. You know, but at some point, the fetus becomes a baby. And we do, you know, wh where do we draw that line? And that's really what this debate about is about. And I think that if what frustrates me about the debate is that there's so much anger and vitriol um, related to it that we don't really have a thoughtful discussion about when does when does the, the life really um mature to the point where we recognize it as a life that has inalienable rights and how does that life um balance when compared to the mother's life because you know if, if the baby is going to kill the mother how many people are saying well the mother just has to die i mean from a just like a strictly utilitarian standpoint do we care more about fetuses than we do about uh, adult women who've been educated and all these other things you know uh, if we're looking at them both as being equal lives yeah so the, that's that's my thoughts on abortion generally right and 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 it's something that i'm very sympathetic to and and something that i really i wanted to encourage both sides to see on this because there is really two very fleshed out very difficult sides and then in between the two sides there's a ton of gray area in between right you know uh a, I, I guess you could say a living se unfertilized cell and a fertilized, you know, well, even, embryo. Even, yeah. Even a fertilized embryo. So I've had, I've had in vitro, mm -hmm. I have a couple of frozen embryos. I've got photographs of them. They're, you know, a dozen cells. I don't look at those and think that they're a baby, that they're life. I, I just, just don't have that concept of <laughs> frozen embryo being a child. Mm -hmm. I, it, it has value to me. I mean, because it's got my genetic material and it, it's the potential for a life, which is something that I've been trying for. But I, you know, I think that we can go too extreme in either direction. We can go too extreme and say the second the egg is fertilized, it's a life. And we can go too extreme and say, you can have an abortion up until the umbilical cord is cut. I, I don't think either of those is the correct position. So yeah, it's it's tough. And I think and, and I'm going to let me go ahead and say some pro-life stuff here real quick, just because I, I, I do want both sides represented, both when I talk to you, the pro-choicer and when I will talk to the pro-lifer. Mm -hmm. I think pro-life for me, if I was to just go with my conscience, is the natural position that I would have. I I mentioned my experiences at the hospital and the, the procedure is you 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 know, you, you euthanize the embryo. Um, you know, kill it. And then you reach in, you clamp down on the, the, what, what is supposed to be the brain and you pull it out. Right. Mm -hmm. And it is a graphic, brutal, disgusting display. And I, I, I think some people see the videos and they're like, Oh, nobody wants to see that. And I think, but sometimes you just have to, because I think it does inform you. It's one thing to just talk about these lives on paper and it's another thing to see it happen. And right. ha having been, I, it's tough for me and, and I'll let you respond to all this, but it is hard. My emotional state was definitely, and still is impacted when you see a fetus try to wriggle away from a needle that is trying to euthanize it. And we have all these generalities. Oh, hands haven't really developed yet, or you know, heartbeat's supposed to start around this time. But much like anything, like puberty, we have generalities. But you know, we're lucky if we get it within a few months. You know, much less a few years as far as how it develops. And I think pregnancy is very the same. We would like to say, oh, at four months your baby looks like this. It, at five months it looks like this. Well, that's not always the case. And sometimes what they pull out is far more developed than what was supposed to what we were expecting to pull out. And it's hard. I think when you see little fingers and I was lucky enough to not see one that was botched, but they are performed by humans. So 
we under I understand when they are botched. We have had the needle miss before, but the clamp crushed the brain, and and you know, so when they pull it out, it wasn't crying or whatever. But we have, I, I mean, I I absolutely believe the videos when I see them pulling out a living child that, where they crush the ribs or something, and it's like. I guess I say child I, again. I might be revealing maybe my inner bias. I'm not trying to do that because I am, I am at the end of the day pro-choice because I don't believe the government should be making this decision. However, it is a brutal process and one that I am very interested in seeing decrease as far as volume goes. I, I mean, would you have? I guess would you need to qualify anything that I just said with some of your own viewpoints? Yeah, I would. So okay. first of all, um, statistically, most. Uh, the vast majority of abortions that are happening are happening in the first trimester mm. and a first trimester abortion is going to be uh, a, a hormone that's given to you and that that uh, starts a uh, bleeding and removes the implantation mm -hmm. followed by uh, a dnc which i have personally had probably um at least a dozen dncs not because i've been pregnant but because i've that's a, a treatment for my issue but um, all they go in and do for a DNC is that they um, dilate you and then they remove the endometrium, which is the same uh, tissue that you have when you have your period as a woman. Right. So that is, uh, you know, th that is a much less graphic experience than what you're describing. Yeah. Um, and that is the vast majority of, of uh, abortions. Now, the other problem is that we, you're right, we can't peg things very perfectly. We have a hard time knowing exactly when the egg was fertilized, exactly when it implanted. Uh, nine months is a rough estimate of the gestation. It's not an exact. Um, and the heartbeat can ha comes very, very early in, um, in the pregnancy. And so a lot of times a woman won't even know she's pregnant and that window for abortion will have already closed and yet it's still, um, more or less a mass of cells that hasn't taken on a lot of human form. Uh, when you start talking about a second trimester abortion, where you're now removing um, something that uh, a fetus that resembles more of a human being, um, I think we could have a, a, a mature discussion about when that is an appropriate thing to do. Because I don't think a lot of women are having abortions later in pregnancy for convenience reasons. They're not doing, they're not flipping out and saying, oh, I don't want to be a mother. I mean, certainly I wouldn't say that, that never happens, but just in my experience with other women and, and one in three women have had abortions. I know many of women who've had abortions. They've all had them. Every woman I know who's had an abortion for convenience reasons has had it early on where she had an accidental pregnancy with an unsuitable partner or an early time in her life or a, a time in her life where she would not have been able to sustain the baby. Every woman I know who's had an abortion later has had uh, to abort a wanted pregnancy for health reasons. Um, and I've only, I only know a couple women who've had them really late and those have been devastating for them as devastating as say a miscarriage or a stillbirth and mm -hmm. so i think the idea that women are just um cavalierly you know committing violence to fetuses is uh is a mistaken idea and i i can certainly understand your ap misapprehension after seeing those procedures but i think that we have to look at them within the context of what's really happening broadly and whether that's happening most abortions or and why those are happening right and this is and i will say and i did mention in this on the post as well i had i've also never seen one out of convenience now i only worked at the hospital i i think for uh, it was like a year right i worked at the hospital i was right. on an ambulance before that i worked on a hospital after that i saw many but not you know, by far, I, I did not by any means see all of them. Do I know people have them at, out of convenience? Yeah, there's, the, I think MTV showed a couple girls that were like, we're getting abortions done. Yay, we're cool this month. You know what I mean? And, and right. you know, shock value. But I never once had anybody walk into the hospital that was like, hey, I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to, this is just how I do birth control now. I mean, it's, right. it's expensive. It's difficult. It's painful. And there, it's, there's, there's, and there's risk, ri risk you know, involved. You yeah. Yeah, even an early abortion, those DNCs cause scar tissue and other problems mm -hmm. that could prevent you from having children later. It's not; it's definitely not ideal, and and as you as you said, it's expensive and it's painful. Like you're going to be cramping and all these other things for, you know, it's just not. It, I, I don't know a single woman who goes, oh yeah, I just do that rather than take, 
the birth control pill or have an IUD or something else. Right. I mean, there are many other ways to have birth control that are much more convenient. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. The, the and, and so to bring up the pro-choice part, and I just, uh, you know, I think it's time I, I kind of navigate over to that direction a little bit in spite of the things that I saw, which still makes it so that I would like to see as few of them as possible. I don't see... Let's go ahead and talk about the law. I don't see legal legally getting into the right place because the issue is is yes, I was disturbed by the lives that I saw ended. But I was also disturbed by the people making those choices and having those problems. I never once saw anybody do it with their family all around them and say, hey, yeah, we'll support you throughout this whole thing. Um, you know, never once with a partner who is just like, oh, yeah, I just want to make sure she's OK through this. That for me, it just seemed that socially taking care of the problem would, would have been far more effective than legally taking care of the problem. We know that right. we can make it illegal, but it still happens. And, right. you know, uh, um, the Native Americans, in fact, when they were going through what they were doing on the Trail of T Tears, um, I was reading I was reading a book about it and they uh, they talked about how they would eat certain plants and uh, or even shove certain plants that they knew were harmful to, I guess, the uterus up there in order to have these abortions so they didn't have to bring these children into this world. Right. Ultimately, at some point, it's kind of like guns. You're banning plants. You have to ban plants you have to ban you know coat hangers you have to ban you know to try and get it under control it seems right. like a seismically difficult thing now correct me if i'm wrong you're the legal expert roe v wade isn't protected because whether it is or isn't a human life it's protected because it would be too much invasion of privacy which seems to me an accurate assessment to find out if right. somebody's pregnant requires a great deal of invasion of privacy right it's it's an invasion in their medical care mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's so, yeah, it's the right to privacy, but it's also, you know, it, it's regulating the doctors who are trying to make uh, medical decisions based on what their their patients need. And so uh, the thing with the with Roe v. Wade is I think at the time that it was decided, it was decided around the same time as all the sodomy cases were also decided where th there was this idea of we need to stop criminalizing people's personal lives and their their health and their sex. Um, and so we have a line of cases that are on these right to privacy laws. Now, uh, I think if you look at Roe versus Wade, uh, strictly from a constitutional reasoning standpoint, uh, outside the context of these other cases, you, could, you would say that it is not well supported by the text of the Constitution. And that certainly was my uh, conclusion when I first read it back in law school. But as you look at all of the other cases that have uh, come out around the same time and have flowed from Roe versus Wade, you would have a very difficult time um, overturning that decision at this point because this idea of privacy, which actually existed prior to the Constitution and throughout our common law, um, is it's it's well established and it's well established in a multitude of areas, not just in abortion. And so the problem that we're having here is that there's going to be all of these, there's all this legislation that is aimed at um, bringing a challenge that's going to create a bunch of circuit decisions. And then once there's a bunch of circuit decisions, wh wh however they go, whether they overturn or uphold the laws, uh, once there's several of them, then the, then the Supreme Court typically will take up a case where there's a bunch of circuits who are fighting over how to apply the precedents. I think the hope for um, the pro-life people is that now that we have a conservative majority on the Supreme Court, that they will uh, limit or overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, but I think that that would be a bad move um, as a Jewish jurisprudence uh, from a jurisprudence standpoint. And I think that the court's going to be reluctant to do it because of how upsetting it will be on all these other issues. It's, it's not just abortion. It's um, everything from our sex lives to how we um, are, how we uh, talk to, about things with our doctors and privileges that we have. Um, it's, it's marriage, it's other um, issues of how you're raising your children, whether you have, whether you have to vaccinate, all of these things implicate sure. the same right to privacy. It makes sense. If, if you way. give the government the ability to say, oh, except, they're going right. to use the accept for more issues than just the one that you're thinking about. So if we say right. you can't invade privacy 
Except for abortion, they'll just be like, well, okay, because abortion's a big deal. Right. Let's point at everything else that's a big deal. <laughs> and you're right that from a policy standpoint, uh, people prohibition never works and people will just yeah. engage in black market behavior mm -hmm. and it hurts the poor people the most. They're going to be the ones who engage in the riskiest behavior. A rich person can fly to France or whatever. A mm -hmm. poor person is going to be stuck, um, you know, running over to Mexico or trying to do it and, you know, uh, in their house in a bathtub you know and that's what we saw before which was exactly why abortion uh wh why we hit roe versus wade's decision in the first place from a policy standpoint sure i do think that there's a possibility that congress is going to act if the states continue to pass laws and because the congress is a democratic majority and they have an argument that uh abortion hits um inter interstate commerce because of people you know well i mean interstate commerce now is so broadly interpreted but um you know p medical care is basically now being legislated by congress as we've seen in a bunch of other acts they could do it for abortion as well uh there i think congress will avoid doing that as long as they can because of how divisive the issue is mm -hmm. but if it gets to the point where um it, it's becoming a, a serious problem and we're, we're having a major split amongst the states we might see Congress act. And so, and then that's going to be further erosion away from the state's rights. So I, I feel like the pro-life pro, pro people are making a mistake in how they approach this. I think that yeah. you can legislate and, and the Supreme Court's allowed states to, to limit abortion so that it's not just, you know, a free for all and it can be regulated to some degree. But the vast majority of Americans, something like over 70 percent of Americans in favor, at least some abortion and to limit it to the point where it's heartbeat, you're essentially prohibiting it. You're criminalizing the doctors. And I think that there's going to be a backlash related to that. Yeah. the, the and, and heartbeat's a tough one, because, again, this is when people start to recognize that you could have a very serious problem with the fetus slash future child, even if you believe right. it's a child. It's right. that's when you can find, oh, the heart is beating, but it's beating right. outside of its chest right now. There is a heartbeat and it's not connected to the head. There is a so like straight miscarriage. Doctors also recognize certain uh, symptoms at that point and they test it and they say, oh, this this child is going to not, never live past one years old, year old and have live in agony the entire time. Right. And right. you just and then, say, and how does that implicate? The parents' choices. So, so let's say that the mother's forced to carry to term a child who's got severe disabilities. Mm -hmm. she, she births the child. The child cannot live off of life support. Yep. Now, is the, is the mother obligated to keep the child on life support for the rest of its, you know, life for right. the next several years, or mm -hmm. can they, can they pull the plug, so to speak? And so now you're getting to all these other additional issues that are um, equally complex. Right. You know, euthanasia issues and all that other stuff. And and why? Why are we? I think that's cruel, honestly. I think it's cruel to the mother, and I think it's cruel to the to the um, the disabled child. Yeah, there, there, and they're really, and that's the other half of this equation here. We deal so much with the child, the child, the child. There is a mom. The mom is going through some things. the The condition, the problem that I have with legislating this issue, if I feel like that we could effectively eliminate all the needless MTV girl abortions we talked about, that'd be one thing. But whenever you give Congress the ability to say, OK, well, we're going to make a black we're going to take this gray issue and make it crazy black and white and we'll right. say, OK, so no, if there's a heartbeat and then some issue will come up and then be like, well, OK, I guess if you have to keep it alive and it won't live past one years old, then OK, let maybe an exception for that. But, you know, children and, and women are affected this entire time while those laws are being passed. Nothing is getting done in the meantime. Bad decisions right. are being made. Doctors right. are unable to do what they believe is the right thing to do. They're unable to coordinate with the mothers on what is the right thing to do. And we and so really for me, I, I think that if you were to open this up to a free market issue, that in general, instead of spending all that money to try and hire a con congressional goon to do something that you want to do, you'd be able to spend that money providing support that would make that child much more viable in this world, you know, or, and, and make that decision much more the way that you want right. to. It's right. a, it's a, like I said, from my very conscience and my conscience is not unique in this. I get sick about it. Even if it's just a cluster of cells, I kind of don't feel great about it. And I don't think anybody feels great about it. And it's not right. like mine's unique in that regard or we've all got, you know, I know some people are born soulless and without conscience, but 
I know that if if you would have to find a doctor okay with doing really gross stuff as well as a patient content with doing really gross stuff, and that that won't operate in a free market because there's right. not enough doctors that are okay with doing it as well as enough patients that are okay with having it done. And right. it would be way too expensive and it just wouldn't, it would, it would drastically cut down on the numbers. So for me, with my goal being to really eliminate it unless it is absolutely necessary, I feel like that is better handled outside of the law than it is inside of the law. Right. I agree with you. And I will say this, if we're talking about, we want to get rid of abortions that are done for the convenience of the mother, then we're really talking about abortions that are being done um, typically with young mothers, teen mothers, or impoverished mothers in the first trimester. And there, we know that there are ways that we can address that with birth control and other things. So I, the LNC yep. just came out with a statement today talking about how Colorado made birth control free for young uh, women and abortions were reduced by 42%. So we, we can just look at the data and know that that is possible. I think that these laws um, aimed at reducing the when abortions can be can occur. They don't focus on getting rid of unnecessary abortions. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they're harming women who are in an untenable place health wise already. And so that's the problem that I have with it. You know, like, why are we punishing women who have health issues? Mm -hmm. Let's focus on having fewer te uh, teen pregnancies. And you bring up and there's all these exceptions, but the thing is every exception, you can say, oh, that's less than 1%, but then you add them all up together and you get a good chunk, right? I mean, this is, right. you don't go to a hospital if you're in a 99% issue. Hopefully right. you're not in a hospital more than 1% of your life. <laughs> if you're in a hospital, you're probably there because you're in a 1% or less issue, you know? Right. And so, yes, you can find out you have the, or the fetus or yourself has some disease and you don't know, like, and, 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 and doctors don't find this stuff out until you try. And so then the, the issue becomes then is, you know, we like to believe that our politicians would do common sense legislation, but that's never been the case. And so really, I just, I think for me, when, when I see all these one percents and we're like, and where we say, okay, that's valid. Okay. Rape. I get it. Okay. Incest. I get it. Okay. A disease. I get it. Okay. It threatens the mother. I get it. Well, you end up saying I get it so many times, but can you convince all of Congress to get it as well, the way that you get it? Or is really the pe people who get it best, the mother, her family, and the doctor? And right. so I guess for me, that's where I come down on it as far as being a personally pro-life person. I would like to see the pro-life position succeed. I would rather treat, you know, and I'm sorry you're going through your condition, but I would like to treat whatever your condition is before we live in like some society where abortion's just for funsies and you put 25 cents in a gumball right. machine and the gumball you're chewing on kills your fetus. You know, I, I, I would love to see that happen, but I, I just yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, I, I'm with you, you know, like I, I desire to get pregnant so badly that to me, when I see a young woman get pregnant, like I have an emotional response to that when somebody just gets pregnant really easily and I can't, mm -hmm. like, I feel jealous about that. I feel upset about that. Like it's, it's a whole thing for women who have infertility, yeah. you know, but at the same time, I recognize how delicate my health care is and my fertility is and I recognize that other women have that and so when you say oh I've heard, had people say to me well you're such the exception you know you're there's not there's not that many women who are at risk for uterine rupture or whatever well okay but when you make legislation that can that tells me I have to either be sterilized or I have to um, risk death that matters to me a whole lot you know it, it still hits impacts my life and, you know, I have had a bunch of experiences in my health over the years where I've been told, you know, that the chances of having something, so I've had endometrial cancer, for example, oh, the chances of having that are so little, you know, my doctors, don't worry, don't worry, like only one in a thousand, one in 10,000 gets that. And then I get it, you know, I've had that happen to me several times. So, you know, I, I don't want to risk the lives of people who are innocent people mm -hmm. um, because, we want to legislate morality on other people. And it's the same thing with other, with our drug wars, with the, with the problems that we're having right now with opiates, um, even the death penalty, all those things. If you're going to risk the lives of innocent people, um, then maybe that's not the best policy. And, and you're right. The doctors are the ones who have uh, the, 
the best insight, the doctors and the, and the mother. And I don't, I also do not believe that there are a lot of doctors out there who are just willing to kill babies willy nilly. I've never met one. Uh, my doctors have always been very caring and they get into medicine because they want to bring babies into the world, right. <laughs> not the opposite, you know? Right. They they are attempting to do no harm as much as they can, and they see right. two choices with a lot of harm, and they're just trying to minimize the harm. I mean, right, this exactly. you got a whole field of people that are passionate about it. Well, Alicia, we're going to go ahead and wrap up with our final thoughts here. I really just want to impress upon people from both sides of the aisle to think outside of the box on this one. I think we are so focused on telling Congress to see it our way. But I just don't trust a group of politicians to get together and make a law that makes a lot of sense to everybody, even a law that makes sense to most people. (laughs) I mean, even if you think Congress is pretty good, I mean, you'd be in the minority already. But even if you think politicians generally do a good job of regulation and writing things up and enforcing things, can you trust them to get it all of the time? And in this situation... If you can't trust them to get it all of the time, would you rather err on the side of your friend, Alicia, or would you rather err on the side of a politician making a judgment call about it? Right. And and really, I just feel like you're going to take the side of your friend all of the time. And we want, of course we want to, or I guess I'll speak for myself, but of course I want to encourage pro-life. Of course I want them to, to give birth. And like you said, there's even like a jealousy there. Like you want them to have these children, you are excited for it. You, you pop balloons and, and you know, right. you, you, that, that are filled with pink or blue and all these fun things that we do nowadays, you know, that we get really excited about. And, and it is something to be excited about. And so, of course, we want to continue that same enthusiasm for life. At the same time, we also, we, there's two lives at, here, at stake here. And we really want to encourage thinking about both of them in equal portions and it is so easy to make a judgment call and say oh these people are just thinking about themselves or think you know right. they think in this way and that way and for me having worked in a hospital i have never seen somebody make a selfish decision like that i've seen a lot of people that were hung out to dry that were placed in a situation of course were, were occasionally bad decisions involved maybe but a lot of the time it was like well i can't go back home like this otherwise my parents will kick me out And I would rather fight a cultural war and changing the battle over people that would kick you out of your house for being pregnant than I would about, you know, I would rather do that than talk in Congress about legislation that is going to make sense for everybody because there's not a lot of sense that goes on there. That's all I have to say about that. Um, We are going to get the pro-life perspective of this in a couple of days. It'll be Friday. It'll be here. So I appreciate everybody watching. Uh, The person who is pro-life is actually watching right now. So Brendan, we'll talk to you Friday. Uh, But let's go ahead and have you wrap up with your final thoughts on this issue. Well, you know, it's funny. You just brought up something else that that I had some experience with, which is adoption. You know, if there are young women who are being left alone and are having late term abortions because they are out of resources and we should be making adoption easier. Um, I have uh, been for years in the adoption process. It's very expensive. It's very difficult. Um, and you know, th- there are tons of ado- uh, children out there who are available for adoption, but they're, they're typically in the foster system and have trauma and things like that that not every new parent is uh, able to deal with. So, you know, that's a whole different issue is how do we make adoption easier for, for these young women who do, uh, do not, uh, have the ability to raise the child and, uh, do not wish to abort it. Um, but, uh, you know, there are other ways that we can focus our attention as opposed to, um, doing prohibition. We can focus our attention, our money, our time, our education, our legislation on, um, helping create more opportunities for better health and better life for women and their children. Awesome. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I always cherish the opportunity to talk with you. I know you are a uh, legal genius and your time is usually worth thousands of bucks an hour, but I'm glad to take uh, 30 minutes of it for free. (laughs) So uh, It's always fun to talk to you. (laughs) You too. I'm I'm happy to be your worst client as long as I have, as as long as you still squeeze me in there. I promise you, you're not my worst client. (laughs) Wow. And I'm not even paying. That's, you have some rough clients. I I occasionally have some clients who who take my time 
promise to pay and then don't pay. Those ones are worse. Mm, <laughs> this mm. I know I'm going into pro bono. I'm this one right off the bat. <laughs> this one right off the bat you already knew. Well, thank you again. <laughs> Uh, you're the, you are great. Uh, everybody, thank you for tuning into the show. I know it's a sensitive issue. We're going to get some more pro-life thoughts on this uh, in a couple days. But uh, for now, uh, thank you for your support, and we will talk to you later. All right. Thank you.